Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, that's the, that's the first bit out of the way. Cool, let's start. Hi, um, my name's Tom Hukins, and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about HTTP clients and Perl. Um, this is what I do. I'm a Perl consultant. I've been working with Perl and the web for many years now, and I help companies deal with their data, use Perl to process it, and then put it up on the web. So I've been doing all sorts of stuff over the years with Perl and HTTP. So today's talk is going to take roughly this kind of structure. We're going to, I'm going to start out telling you a bit about the talk, then go through a few protocols and finish up with some general advice and some tips that I think are useful. So the three protocols I'm going to discuss today are the transmission control protocol, which is basically a way of sending data between two systems. It's the, the thing that most internet protocols build on top of. Um, TLS gives us security. It's often known as SSL. TLS is basically a newer protocol that replaces um, SSL. And last of all, HTTP, which the name says is the hypertext transfer protocol that grew up with the web so that people could request and get web pages. But now it's used not just for web pages, but for web services. And increasingly, it's the protocol that people use just to send data over the internet, re regardless of whatever that data happens to be. So I'm going to talk about two of the most more, more popular HTTP clients today. Uh, LWP user agent. LWP came about with Perl 5. There was a libwww for Perl 4, but it was that, that was rewritten for Perl 5 as LWP. So that's been around about 20 years. So the internet of today is obviously very different to the internet of 20 years ago. But LWP still works and is still commonly used by all sorts of CPAN modules. Um, HTTP Tiny is a newer Perl module, which um, has shipped in the Perl core for recent versions. Uh, it doesn't have any dependencies. And despite its name of being tiny, it's a small implementation, but it's actually quite capable. And so increasingly, people are building uh, clients on top of HTTP Tiny as well as LWP. Now, there are, of course, many, many ways to do it, this being Perl. So I'm not going to talk about the event loops, like, say, PO, any event, IO async. I'm not going to talk about um, clients that build on top of libcurl, which is a C library. So if, you're, if you want to work with event loops, go look into what your event loop provides. If you want something fast, look at the libcurl solutions. There is a module on CPAN <coughs> that uses libcurl, but presents the same interface as LWP. So you can easily migrate your, code, your LWP code over to that and benefit from the performance of using something written in C. Uh, so I'm not going to discuss those today, but be aware that they exist and you might find them helpful. OK, so that's the introduction out of the way. Let's talk about HTTP. I've already mentioned briefly what it does. Um, these are the documents that define it. These, all these um, RFCs, or Internet Standards, have all been published this year. Obviously, HTTP has been around a lot longer, but what people have found is that we've been using HTTP for a long time. So so much on the internet that there were some discrepancies, some quirks, some things that weren't very clear in the original HTTP specification. So people have spent a lot of time rewriting them, making sure everything's up to date. And so RFC 2616 is the old document that you will sometimes or often see referenced. But I would encourage you not to read that old document and to, if you need to go and find out exactly how something does or should work, go look at these newer RFCs. At its most simple, HTTP has a client, sends a request to a server, and then the server sends the response back to the client. And that's all it is. It's not, you, you really can't do anything more with HTTP at its most basic. You send a request, you get a response back. That's it. And that simplicity is kind of limiting, but also really powerful, and it means you can get up and running. And as I said earlier, people use HTTP for all sorts of internet services now. And I think that simplicity is part of the reason why. So the request and the response are both messages. And an HTTP message has a start line and header fields, always. And it might have a message body. So if the client wants to send some data to the server, the request will have a body. If the server wants to send some data to the client, the response will have a body. And 
The request looks a bit like this. The status line is the first line there, and then we have a bunch of headers. This, this request doesn't have a body, so it's really simple, and that's it. And the response that comes back is, again, an HTTP message with a status line, some headers. Um, so the status line here is basically telling us the protocol. It then has a status code, 200, and we'll talk about status codes in a bit. But the response has the, that first line, the headers, and then a body. In this case, we've got some HTML here, but we, it could, you can send absolutely anything over HTTP. Um, this is a bit of a simplification, but it gives you a rough idea of how HTTP works. Now, both LWP and HTTP Tiny provide methods that will show you um, the request and the response, but you don't actually always see exactly what's going on over the wire. So if you want to look, if you're encountering problems and you want to see what's going on, TCP dump is a really useful tool. It basically runs at your operating system kernel level and pulls out the packets going over the network and in this case, stores them in a file called output. You need to specify the inter network interface on your computer, in this case, Ether0. And because you will have lots of data going over your connection, you want to specify the, ho the host of the server you're talking to to filter out only the traffic you want. Wireshark is like TCP dump, but is a graphical interface. Um, you probably don't want to run GUIs on all the machines that you send web requests from. So what I do is I run Wireshark on my desktop, I run TCP dump on the machines that I'm using to run clients on, and then I load the dump into Wireshark so I can analyze it with a graphical uh, tool. And as I've written here, the follow TCP stream basically shows you the HTTP conversation, which makes it easy to debug this stuff. So those are two useful tools. Now, you've probably heard a lot about REST, and REST really is the codification of what HTTP gives us. So, some years ago, people were doing all sorts of things with HTTP that it was available, but they weren't reading the specs, so people were misusing the protocol. And REST was an attempt to codify how to use HTTP properly. And there are many methods in HTTP, <laughs> HTTP but I'm going to talk about these four today. Uh, these four are the most useful for working with web services. So. For example, you might want to fetch, let's imagine we've got a web service that provides information about cities, and we want to fetch some information about a city. GET brings us that data. GET requests shouldn't change anything. So no, no state changes, nothing on the server changes. If you're changing stuff, don't use GET. Um, POST creates a new thing. So let's say we want to add a new city to our database of cities. The data for that goes in the request body, um, and that, that's an example of of creating a new resource. Let's imagine we want to update something. So we've got Sophia in our cities database, and we want to say, yep, see Europe's taking place in Sophia. We can do a put request to change the content of that page. And last of all, let's imagine our city doesn't exist anymore, and we want to delete it. So I talked a bit about status codes earlier. Um, these are the most common ones. Uh, you'll sometimes see people doing things in their code, like checking that the status is 200. And whilst that commonly works, the best way to check is not to check the individual code, but to check the class of codes. So that's why you see the X's here. And LWP provides methods like is success or is error that, that wrap these status codes for you. So it's worth using these uh, wrapper methods rather than just checking the status code itself. So that's HTTP out of the way. Next up is TCP IP. Um, these are basically two protocols. TCP sits on top of IP. And again, there's a conversation between the client and the server. And to initiate, so HTTP runs on top of TCP. And before we can have the HTTP conversation, the client needs to talk to the server to set up the connection. And basically, we've got these obscure terms. The client talks to the server, the server, yeah, wrong button. The server talks back to the client. And after all this, they've established a connection. Now, this might seem a bit, why are they doing these things? But it's important to make sure that there's a reliable connection stream to make sure that the data um, ends up in the right order. Because remember, the internet is a packet-based network. But when you're working with TCP, you don't really care about packets. You just get data coming in and data going back again. That's the useful thing about TCP. Again, TCP dump is the useful tool if you're encountering problems here to go and look at what's going on. Now, 
as I said, TCP runs on top of IP. And there are two versions of IP commonly used on the internet today. There's IPv4, which is old, and we've almost run out of addresses, and we should have stopped using it years ago. But you know, it's there, it works, so we still use it. IO socket IP has been in the Perl core for some releases now. And recent versions of HTTP Tiny and NetHttp use it. Now, NetHttp is the underlying network module that LWP uses. So if you've got very recent versions of these, you can talk IPv6, which is great because we're not going to run out of addresses anytime soon, and the protocol has been um, based upon everything we've learned from what happened in IPv4. So in IPv6 is still a minority thing today, but it's becoming more and more popular on the internet. We do see main, mainstream web providers like Google and Facebook running their sites and their APIs over IPv6. So it is, it is starting to become popular. OK, next of all, so we've talked so far about this wonderful internet where we're sending data between a, a client and a server. And all that data is going over the internet, un completely unencrypted. Um, ah, <laughs> so we want some encryption, and TLS is the protocol that gives us that. So on the left here, HTTP is the unencrypted form of the internet, and that's fine if you're just getting data that no one, you know, you don't mind someone looking at. But of course, if you're doing anything sensitive or secure, you want to use HTTPS. Now, just because you're using TLS, that doesn't mean your um, connection is secure. And there's a lot of detail that we'll come into. But in order to make your connection secure, you want to use HTTPS, which means you're running over TLS. So again, the client and the server are having a conversation this time. So if we're thinking about this as a stack, we've got TCP at the lower level. If we're running TLS, TLS on top of that, and then HTTP on top of that. So what I'm showing you is, is the overhead that's needed to kind of set up connections. So the client says hello to the server. Now. The way that SSL TLS works is using public private key cryptography. And in order for that to work, the server has a public certificate available that it sends to the client. And that's what happens here. The client can also have um, a certificate. But most people, when they're using HTTPS, don't bother with client certificates. But that's not to say it's a bad idea. I think it's a really good idea. It's just not all that commonly used. In addition to that, you can use a whole range of cryptography ciphers. Um, so there are some ci ciphers that are really insecure, and you should configure your server and your client not to use these. TLS actually has a none cipher, which basically means we're using TLS, but don't encrypt the data at all. Um, that might sound crazy, but it's useful for debugging diagnostic things, but don't run it in any production <laughs> environment. Um, the good thing is that most clients and servers have sensible defaults. So basically, if, you, if you're just someone like me who knows nothing about cryptography, you can mostly trust these things to work moderately well. Although, of course, if you are in a very sensitive environment, go and find someone who understands cryptography and ask them for help. Um, and don't try and blag it, because uh, bad things happen when you pretend you know about security. So yeah, we, we've, the client and the server have negotiated what certificate they're using to trust each other and what uh, cryptography mechanism they're going to use to talk to each other. Now, there are two commonly used TLS implementations in Perl, and both HTTP Tiny and LWP can use either of them. And what they both do is they look for IO socket SSL first. If it's already loaded in the process, they'll use it. If NetSSL is already loaded in the process, they'll use that. If neither are loaded, it'll then, they'll then try using them in that order. Now, this isn't really a big deal as a developer, because you'll find that they both work. However, what you need to realize is that you may not be using the same one in different places. If you've got one module installed on one system and another one installed on another system, you'll be using the different ones. Also, if you're in a very strict lockdown environment with um, heavy firewalling, you may find one of these works better than the other one. I'm sure the authors would welcome um, bug reports, but yeah, I've, I've experienced different levels of success with these, both in corporate environments. So if you are having problems, try using a different one. So we talked about certificates, and the way that um, SSL works is you have a certificate attached to a host. So the common name here is rt.perl.org. And basically, the idea of SSL certificates is that you only talk um, you, uh, the, the 
is that the host you're talking to is the host you wanted to talk to. So I could make a certificate, get it signed for, for a host and use it on a different one. So the, the host name is important. You can also have wildcard certificates. So you could have something like here, like star.pearl.org, which means the certificate can be used on any host under the pearl.org domain. Now, unfortunately, both LWP and HTTP Tiny have um, slightly quirky behavior when it comes to SSL. So LWP, for example, before version 6.03, didn't check that the certificate was assigned to the correct host you were talking to, which obviously is a bit of a security hole. So what a lot of people found when they upgraded to 6.03 was some services stopped working. Um, the verify host name Boolean flag there allows you to switch that on or off. I encourage you to always switch it on, but in special cases of firefighting, maybe you need to switch it off. The other thing is that when you create a certificate, that certificate should be signed by a certificate authority. And the idea of certificate authorities is that they're people you trust to sign certificates and say, yes, this person is who they say they are. And all web browsers come with a common set of certificate authorities that your web browser producer has chosen to trust. Uh, you may want to configure that yourself so you can set a file using LWP user agent. And HTTP Tiny uses Mozilla CA by, by default, which means you're trusting the same people that the Firefox web browser trusts. But you can you can define trust for yourself. So if you're, you know you're talking to a particular server, you can say, let's always use you know, a very limited set of certificates to make things a bit more secure there. OK, so that's the protocols. We've been through um, all of those. And now a bit of sort of advice that comes with that. So I've talked to you about the overhead of setting up a TCP connection and then about the overhead of negotiating TLS. Let's imagine that you're talking to a machine that's on the other side of the world somewhere and the latency is really slow. It can take a long time to set up that connection. And if all you do is say, oh, get me this small bit of data, and then you want something else, you've got to renegotiate the session, set up TCP, set up TLS. And you find when you're talking over low latency links, any, any server that's far away, using persistent connections helps. And what that means is that you send a request, get a response back, and you can continue using the same TCP connection for all successive requests and responses. So that can speed things up a lot. Um, and the way you do that, LWP allows you to keep a cache of connections. So the top example here is caching 32 TCP connections. HTTP Tiny is a bit cruder. You can basic, by default, um, they're disabled. But if you set keep alive one, it will keep one connection in a cache. And if you're using web services, keeping one connection cached is great because you're probably just talking to the same server over and over. So that's mostly good enough. Something that I use a lot when I'm writing web clients is URI templates. Again, at the bottom, there's an RFC number. So this is an internet standard. And URI templates are implemented in loads of languages, not just Perl. Uh, the example here that I've got is of two parameters. So the curly brackets are denoting parameters. Um, you pass in some variables to populate those parameters. The URA template module deals with escaping them for you, so you don't need to worry about escaping. In this simple example, we're just passing in parts of the path. But you can also use URA templates to generate bits of the query string to have optional parameters. It's a really powerful module. Um, the module's documentation on CPAN doesn't go into much detail. But if you read the RFC reference there, that, that has a lot of information about how to use URI templates. I don't see many people using them with Perl. Um, have a look. I think they're a really nice way of building URLs. So there's the URL that this example would build. Now, so I, as I said earlier, I hadn't talked about security at the moment. I've talked about the idea of sending requests, getting responses back. But how do you know that you are who you say you are? So HTTP came with basic authentication built in. So if you've ever used your web browser and your browser pops up a box asking you for a username and a password, um, that's HTTP's native authentication. However, what we found in the early days of the web was that lots of designers didn't like this ugly browser box showing up, and they wanted their own nice login forms, or perhaps they wanted something more complicated than a username and a password. And so HTTP cookies are also commonly used for authentication within browsers. Um, but if you're using something like OAuth, which is commonly used for web services, that sits on top of HTTP authentication, just as basic, basic auth 
sits on top of HTTP authentication. And again, LWP and HTTP Tiny provide hooks for that. If you are using OAuth, it's a, real, it's a really painful protocol to use, but loads of popular web services use it, and there are implementations of that on CPAN. OK, so this has been a really quick 20-minute rundown of some of the stuff that you can do with Perl and the web. There is, of course, a whole load more. I've, told, I've mentioned a few documents, a few modules. Um, I couldn't have possibly fitted ev everything into 20 minutes, but I hope that you found that interesting. Um, and that's, that's all for today. Do we have any questions? Yes? Uh, how do you do the HTTP authentication with the, the tiny module? Okay, the question is how do you do HTTP authentication with the tiny module? Um, yeah, but, uh, remember that I had uh, some troubles. Uh, okay. So my, my honest answer off the top of my head is I, I don't know. Um, but if you, if it, it may be that HTTP Tiny doesn't have that built in. And if it doesn't have it built in, there is definitely another. You can use a combination of MIME encoding. There may be a CPAN module that does that for you. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head is the short answer, I'm afraid. Any more? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, I'm having trouble with uh, SOAP to a server that mm -hmm. has a very old for, uh, support for SOAP. And uh, libwww for L, uh, LW user agent uh, can only connect with version 5. When I upgrade to 6, everything fails. Okay. Is that a known problem? Do probably. you know where it comes so, from? Probably. The, the unfortunate thing about LWP is, as I said, it's been around for a long time. The bug queue currently has about 100 tickets in it. And also LWP builds on lots of other modules. I mentioned NetHttp. Um, so there are loads of tickets for these things. There are, unfortunately, problems. And yes, SOAP always brings its own set of headaches. Um, but no, sorry, I don't know off the top of my head again. I think we, if we've got time for one more question, I think we had one from here. Thanks. So you've um, mentioned LWP and HTTP Tiny. What do you think about the other user agents, like especially the ones that do not fully implement um, HTTP, like Hijack, for example? Okay, so I'm stood in front of an audience with lots of opinionated Perl developers, and I've been asked um, what I think of the other modules that exist. Sorry, my answer is going to be predictable. There's more than one way to do it. They all have different use cases. Um, pick the one that works for you. Um, it looks like people are coming in for the next talk, so thank you very much. I'll be around for the rest of the conference. Please come and say hello. Thank you.